welcome to Founders in Biotech. In this podcast, biotech entrepreneurs share their founders' journey and scientific achievements. I'm your host, Sergey Glinka. Today's guest is Professor Yanev Alec. Professor Yanev Alec received his bachelor's degree from Tel Aviv University in Israel in 2006 and a PhD from the Watson School of Biological Sciences at Cold Spring Harbor Lab in 2010. Yanev Alec was an associate professor of computer science at Columbia University and was a PI at the Whitehead Institute MIT. His research interests are computational human genetics. Yanev has been an advisor to multiple companies in the area of genomics and bioinformatics. He also authored over 40 peer-reviewed scientific studies, including multiple papers in science, nature genetics, and nature methods. He holds five patents and has experience in both B2C and B2B in the area of genomics. Professor Yanov Elich was the CSO Chief Scientific Officer of MyHeritage, uh, what we will discuss during this podcast, and currently he is the CEO of Eleven Therapeutics, a company that he co-founded in 2020. Eleven Therapeutics is a biotech company focused on development of groundbreaking RNA therapeutics. Thank you so much, Yanni, for joining us today on Founders in Biotech. Yeah, thank you very much, Sergey. Happy to be here. First of all, we would like to learn more about you. What, what inspired you to become a scientist in the early days? Tell us a bit more about your experience with education. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I always imagined myself being a scientist, like since I was very young, and I was just fascinated by the ability to kind of like use you know use our brains to to build new things and and to basically kind of like in a way control reality it's it's one of the most exciting and successful human endeavors uh, to be a scientist and also it, it means that you're kind of like on the verge of of the unknown right like as a scientist what you know kind of like we are in such a special position that we people actually pay us money to be at the frontier of you know basically the human knowledge and looking for new ways to expand our knowledge as humanity about this world. So like, what's a privilege to be in this type of position? So in you, what was your first, um, um, first step into the science? Um, I remember al- already at the school you have some uh, projects, successful projects already. Yeah, I was like, you know, like early on, like, drawn into science. In fact, even in my high school, I was uh, studying um, kind of like, I wanted to study like physics, but also social sciences. And I did my, some, some work in kind of like um, quantitative analysis of psychological traits as part of my uh, finishing my, my high school diploma, which was actually quite interesting. And uh, to do some um, linear regression and R squared, I was just fascinated by this idea that you can look at some data and you can actually mm-hmm fit an equation and get a, like a slope of a line that describes some mm-hmm. sort of like a relationship between two things and the relationship has some meaning. So I, I was just drawn by the ability to reduce kind of like observations into quantitative laws. Um, later on, I was um, in Israel, we have mandatory army service. So in the army, I, I um, served at Israel intelligence and that was kind of like street fight math and um, computer science in a way. Mm-hmm. So this was a lot of like, it was just a, also another privilege that I experienced was to basically be there. And it's a very different, you know, what you imagine of an army of like, you get orders and do stuff. It's also almost the opposite. You have like, kind of like, almost like total freedom to do whatever you want in a way mm-hmm. and uh, to experience different things, to build different things, to just test your ideas. You're very young, you know, in your like super early 20s even before in, in, in your 20s. And there is like, in a way, in the army, like no resources at all, because there is no money, right? You cannot buy stuff, but there is also infinite resources because like everything is free in a way, you just need to convince people to give you access to, to different things. So, and, and you have this expensive equipment that you can try to use and just like expensive labs. And, and so you just need to basically harness like the, the buyout of some people to help you like in your projects. So it's a, in a way, it's kind of like an incubator. It's basically mm-hmm. like an incubator of like, so many great founders came from the same place that, you know, I went to the army. 
because it's, it's a great training. And so that was my kind of like early years in science. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, that you had interest already early on in physics and social sciences. Could yeah, I was quite diverse about like, yeah, I wanted to learn about economy and about psychology, but also physics. And I, I had a hope that I can actually bridge between the two, between like, you know, like, yeah, that's like when you are young and naive and you are like, you know, in your uh, high school that I would be able to study both and I can, you know, like just bridge between the two. But I think since then I do have affinity for problems that are cross-disciplinary. In many things, like many, I think some of the beauty of science and the elegance is that you find a solution in one field to a problem in a different field. And even think, for example, you know, let's, let's talk today like about uh, large language models, right? So this is actually like, you mm -hmm. know, we are, finding solutions for many like things in the area that what would be maybe, you know, like 50 years ago we describe as literature, as stuff that is related to like human language, not as like pure computer science, as algorithms and things like that, but, but a quite big difference between where we started. Same thing in genomics, right? I did some work on DNA storage, how to store information in DNA. And... DNA is a digital molecule, so you can actually encode it to store files. So it's, again, you take two different things, right? One from like mm -hmm. computer science, one from genomics and biology, and you can marry those things together. So I think just as a scientist, I was like fascinated about these hidden connections between entities that breaks what's like, you know, university or institutional lines about knowledge and about domains and about mm -hmm. like... Uh, no, well, we have like the School of Engineering and the School of Life Sciences and the School of, uh, um, I don't know, like uh, humanities. And in fact, you know, deeply they are all connected. Nature doesn't care about like which dean and which school you are. It's like all nature presents problems to you. So um, that would explain why you, you were interested in, in bioinformatics. So you went uh, to the U.S. to do your PhD in bioinformatics. Yeah, so in 2006, I moved to the U.S. To, to pursue my Ph.D. And I I was tasked in my Ph.D. project to, to work on RNAi, which I refused totally, because I heard there is this new technology called um, high-throughput sequencing. And Cold Spring Harbor, where I did my Ph.D., was one of the first installations of the Solexa, which is now the Illumina sequencing mm -hmm. technology. And I thought, okay, here is a machine, and I really want to understand how this machine works and how can I improve the sequencer. And, you know, being in the intelligence for some time, you realize that you can take, you know, a machine and you can reverse engineer it, right, to understand the components of the machine. So I thought, okay, let's, let's apply the same approach to select our Illumina sequencing. Let's just try to play with this machine, try to reverse engineer the process, and if I know what the engineers put in this machine, how they intended to utilize it, I, maybe I can hack it and make, make it like a better machine, right? So this is exactly what I did. And I was able to, in 2007 already, 2008, sequence 80 nucleotides long on this technology. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, it was 80, sound like now today, it's like, what's, what's 80? It's nothing, right? You can do 250 or 300. But at that time, this was like basically the world record of, of sequencing. Um, for, for this type of technology. So this is kind of like the, the um, my PhD work was really about high throughput sequencing and different algorithms for high throughput sequencing and I um, was quite fascinated by that. And, and this is why I decided to go to work on like bioinformatic problems. Okay, so uh, sounds like during your PhD you had already some, you were in the interface between machines that you optimize and also developing algorithms how to so you improve like increase the throughput you had more data and you also also develop algorithms how to analyze this data yeah another problem that i was quite fascinated in my phd it was a practical problem presented by my pi um which is let's say that you have tens of thousands of samples and you would like to sequence those samples to identify samples with very rare variant or very rare genetic manipulation that you conducted on this uh, population. 
So if you try to scale it up with high throughput sequencing and to do a sample prep, to barcode each sample and to do a sample prep, it doesn't scale. It will cost so much money that it will be quite cost prohibitive. But what I devised, and this was actually came quite like relatively as a quick solution, is that a method that you can pull these samples in combinatorial patterns. And so kind of like each sample will participate in a small number of pools, each of which with a different with different combination of other samples. Interesting. And and then you sequence the samples and you look at the combination of pools that have these rare variants, and you can in many cases deconvolute it back to the original samples. Yeah, I was always fascinated by by the sequencing technology because it sounds like you don't you don't sequence everything; you just um, have some algorithm or shortcuts what to sequence when and then you kind of use this information to deconvolute what and integrate it in the data yeah. um so so, so yeah, so, yeah. So, so this problem about like you no know, this like combinatorial sequencing is very similar to solving a sudoku puzzle in fact you can see there is a mathematical equivalence almost mm -hmm. between the two problems um you can represent this problem of of this finding rare variants in groups of samples as if you're in a Sudoku puzzle and you, because in a Sudoku you also have knowledge only about the pools, which are the rows, the, the columns and the squares. And so kind of like with this knowledge, you need to solve the entire Sudoku puzzle. It's actually a very similar process here. That's, that's eventually, let's pause for a moment. And how, yeah. like, I'm curious, how is it represented in, in your mind? Because like Sudoku, like, and, and, Gene sequencing sounds very distant. Is, w how is it represented in, in, in your mind, this, this problem where you say it's, it's actually a shared uh, problem? You can actually, like both Sudoku and this problem, you can represent them as graphs, mm -hmm. that each sample is like a node in the graph. And you have kind mm -hmm. of like all the samples, it's kind of like one long list of like nodes in the graph. And the other, the data that you obtain basically the pools are a different type of nodes and and each the pooling like structure is basically the edges mm -hmm. and the same thing you can do with a sudoku like all the like each cell is a node in a graph and the knowledge about the row the square and the col and the column are actually mm -hmm. like the other type of nodes and it's actually there is a mathematical equivalent to the same algorithm that solves this solves the other the other problem it's the same algorithm and, and it's, I think that's also, it's kind of like, that's the beauty of science, right? You can go and you look at these different, totally different domains, and there is very, like the same solution solves both problems. By the way, there is actually, a, it's entire, like if in physics, spin glass problems also are present in the same way. So it's like, you, you can go from gene sequencing to spin glass in physics to Sudoku puzzles. They all have very similar attributes in terms of the way that you can represent them. That's very cool. So, yeah. um, so you have this, the, the PhD that you do, you have uh, the technology, you scale the throughput, you develop methods, you solve problems, um, like how to analyze tens to thousands of samples. And then uh, what I stumbled upon is, is something that is called a genome hacker. So you are labeled <laughs> yeah early on as genome hacker by, uh, was it science? Like nature. By, uh, by nature. Uh, nature, by, uh, by a journal. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> why, how, how was it coined, these, uh, this term? Yeah. So I, I, I moved to MIT after my PhD. I got my own lab at the Whitehead Institute. And I kind of like learned about some people who were conceived by sperm donation that... Um, they want to find their fathers, so they actually look at the Y chromosome. And one of them was able to identify his father. And I was like, wow, that's cool, really. Because if you think about it from a human genetics perspective, for most of us in Western societies, well, most of males in Western societies, we get our surnames from our fathers. And they got it from their fathers and from their fathers and so on. Mm -hmm. And we also get a Y chromosome along the same route, which creates a correlation between the Y chromosome and your uh, surname. 
So, and, and there are DNA databases online with Y chromosome data and surnames. Just people, you know, that are interested in genealogy, that are enthusiasts, they document this, uh, this mm-hmm. data online. So I, I ask myself, okay, is this a problem for society? Like that, not talking about this like sperm conceived individuals, but really about when we go and do some genetic research, we promise people typically anonymity. And I wanted to know whether this is like a, a valid promise that we give people. <laughs> so I was uh, basically conducting this research to see whether I can identify on a very large scale, basically like a systematic research to see whether I can identify individuals from the Y chromosome and calculating the probability of someone from like a male in the US to be identified using this strategy. And I was, it, this technique is like quite powerful. And we also refined this technique. We showed that we can do it even from high throughput sequencing data, which at that time was like, people didn't think it's possible. So we, we actually identified people from the thousand genomes project using this technology. Mm-hmm. And it was an interesting story because when I submitted the manuscript at the beginning, they told me like it was rejected from everywhere. People told me it doesn't work. And then when I showed the thousand genomes that I can actually find these individuals, people told me, oh, like maybe we should not publish this manuscript because it's too scary. So kind of like it's like from, it went from like, it doesn't work okay. there. It works too well that we cannot even publish it. But eventually I got like a very smart editor in science. She was very like, she was like quite senior and, and well, um, very thoughtful about how to manage this type of like manuscript and we publish it and kind of like Sergey, this was like pre Snowden. This was pre Cambridge Analytica. This was in the days where big data was cool. Like mm-hmm. Facebook was a cool company, not the evil company that's stealing <laughs> like, you know, like, no, like, uh, uh, this like massive evil company by Mark Zuckerberg, but really like, just like the coolest thing ever created, not for boomers like now. And, <laughs> And so I was not very popular those days, right? Talking about problems in big data and actually showing that there are some unintended consequences in big data and particular in genomics mm-hmm. that you can identify individuals in a very, um, it's not that difficult to, to identify them. So this is how I got the, this thing about like the, the genome hacker uh, by nature. The genome hacker, okay. So, but it's typical with uh, high impact paper, uh, like publications that first it's rejected, then it's maybe published in some minor journal. And then uh, in your case, it was, uh, you kind of added the, the additional data and it was published uh, on high impact journal. Uh, but at least from drug discovery, a couple of publications that were rejected initially, but then um, the industry adapted some, uh, some methods. Um, but it seems like you have a, tremendous academic career, you developed some um, technologies that are first rejected, but then adopted, and um, you become kind of a leading, a key opinion leader probably in this in this space, but then you can decide to work for a company. Um, although, like, things you have developed, this the innovation was, uh, comes from academia, but then you decide to switch to to company and become the chief scientific officer of my heritage, what was the, the the process behind it? Yeah, so I think that, that it's a kind of like a few things that happened like you know at the same time. The first one is that I was curious about companies for for like quite some time. Right, so like I was quite lucky that early on in my career I was asked to be a consultant of several companies. Mm-hmm. And I was like, was like, you know, like thinking, okay, like how does it like work on that? Like, you know, for these people, right? Like, you know, like, so just like was fascinated by how they operate, which is quite oh, different than the way that academics <laughs> operate and mm-hmm. the way that academics think. And so, and also the ability to build very large teams, it's, it's very different than the isolation that you have, especially as a PI, right? So that was like one element. The second element is that in 2015, we put together an academic website called DNA.land, which this website was, um, the point was to crowdsource genomic data from people to say, okay, if you participated with 23andMe, my heritage, uh, Ancestry.com, you can donate your genome for genetic research. And as kind of like a token of appreciation, we will analyze your genome in a different way and we'll give you some hints about your genome. So I had to build a few algorithms to take, to do that on, on a scale. And the website was immensely successful. When we launched the website, 
on the first week, we got 5,000 genomes. So we got like everyone on the community, basically wow. people don't like, after two years of operation, 170,000 genomes were collected by this website, which is insane. Think about an academic project, yeah. suddenly have like, you know, more data at that point was like almost like the UK Biobank developed by, you know, a team of like a few individuals, like in terms of genomic data. But to build, actually to run this website, this was a total nightmare from an academic perspective because... Mm -hmm. You have this website. Now, people, you know, they come to the website, they say they are, they donate their genome to scientific studies, but actually they, they want it for their own benefit. They want to find relatives. They want to do some other things. So they ask, you know, they start to bombard you with emails about, oh, this feature doesn't work or like this, like, why did I get these results? So you have, I, now, I, I cannot have like students answering these emails. I try to do it myself. You're just being exhausted. You, you want to die after like two weeks, right? And I, so I eventually was able to hire someone to basically come twice a week to answer emails. But then you think about, okay, what, are, what is the next feature? How am I developing mm -hmm. the next one? So it's kind of like product development, but product, mm -hmm. you know, speech, these students, they need to graduate. They don't want like to develop it. That's fine. Right. You, you cannot find like a product manager. So at some point I was like, okay, you know what? I'm quite curious about how you can build websites like that. I want to learn how to like do it. Like from, so my heritage at that time, I was about to launch their DNA database and like basically to, to launch a DNA product, sorry. So they asked me if I would like to join them. And the third kind of like reason was that uh, this was after 11 years in the US and I was a bit exhausted of like just academia and working in isolation. I checked all the boxes in academic research. So I wanted to experience something different. I want to go and really see how it is to like build a company, like, you know, like launch a product how you think about that. So I thought, why not? Like, you know, I can, and I can also, I was able to maintain my position at Columbia University at that time. So I said, mm -hmm. okay, that's, it's not that high risk. So I think all these, like, you know, four reasons, right? Like, it's like, mm -hmm. I was always curious about, about companies, my experience in DNA land, wanted to go to Israel, to just kind of like, you know, being like closer to my family. And this unique opportunity to be part of like a company that is mm -hmm. like, you know, very successful and learn about those type of things were all like coming together. Um, it's interesting. It's a the typical, you launch a product, you have traction, need customer service, product development, um, et cetera. Um, so my heritage is quite, quite successful. Um, and um, you apparently had some significant impact, um, although um, it's, I haven't found a lot of um, a lot of data about that, but just analyzing the data, um, I assume it had led to a great product. Um, but then you kind of switch to, to the biotech, like from analyzing um, yeah. genetic data, then you co-found 11 Therapeutics, um, which is, again, something you want to experience something new or you want to build something, uh, something different. Both, because I, mm -hmm. so on the one hand, in my heritage, we, we, the company exited. And it was like, you know, basically when company exits, it's like, it's a good time also to think about, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, what, what do you want to do next? Right. So mm -hmm. I kind of like saw the, you know, involving this, like launching of this DNA product, the company exited, I kind of like finished. And this was exactly like four years. So it was a good time to think about what, what to do next. The second thing is like, I, I wanted to be a, a, the founder of a company. I wanted to start my own company mm -hmm. and see how, how it is. I think even I can more contribute at early stages than late stages. My heritage is more late stage, but I'm, I'm very kind of like, I, I'm pretty good at like early stage when there are not many resources and to basically be able to create things out of thin air. Um, and uh, so that was the reason kind of like to start something new. And also I wanted to something different because with my heritage, it's a great company, but I really wanted to do something more deep tech, something that will be involved therapeutics so you can impact like human life in a different way, not just to read mm -hmm. biology as the way that we did with my heritage, but to write mm -hmm. biology, mm -hmm. to change the course of people and to do it with a kind of like technology that is kind of like going more to the unknown in a way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is how we started 11 Therapeutics. Uh, Going to the unknown, it's, it's great. Um, yeah, it's kind of the, the founder's journey. But um, 
can we take a deep dive in into the let's talk about eleven therapeutics? Like, can we take a deep dive into like non confidential part um, of the technology? From um, so, what I understood, you want to build, you want to solve actually two problems. But before we di- like dive into those two problems, you mentioned earlier on that you refused to work to, for a PhD on, um, um, uh, like, um, RNAi, yeah. RNAi, exactly. Cool. Uh, thanks. Um, <laughs> and it's funny that you now um, ha- you founded a company that actually um, designs and, and screens those those compounds. But what are the challenges with RNAi's in in general, and what are the challenges to bring them as therapeutics? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So so Eleven started as an RNAi company, but now our scope is is bigger. And also involves mRNA, so kind of like it's more RNA therapeutics company rather than RNAi company. And so the challenges of RNA therapeutics is really the, there is one part is the delivery of these molecules, and the other one is our ability to really unlock the value of these therapeutics from the kind of like the, the chemistry. So chemical biology really is a different problem because mm-hmm. the way that is RNA molecules work in the body, they are under the constraint that they need to be produced from the genome. So they must undergo this DNA to RNA and then act as some some sort of like RNA molecules in your body. When we generate these molecules in RNA therapeutics, synthetically, we can use new types of chemistries that Mm -hmm. are totally inaccessible for the so like for organisms to produce. Yep. They can be synthetic. They can have different building blocks. For instance, right, like one common thing that uh, people are doing in, you know, like that's more basic research is labeling these molecules with fluorophores. You cannot do that. In, in There is not like a, any natural reaction to do that. But we can do it using uh, basically chemical biology. We can actually like modify these, these molecules. And it has been shown that these types of modifications can unlock significant value for these molecules and their therapeutic potential. For instance, in the case of RNAi, although your body produces short RNA that triggers the RNAi system, it has been found that if you modify every nucleotide along the short sequence of RNAi molecules, you get much better response and importantly a very long durability mm-hmm. of these molecules for instance in the case of inclisiran which is an, a drug developed by alnylam inclisiran works in the liver for six months so just think about like st- mol- rna molecules wow. that mm-hmm. can stay for six months within the body and do stuff which Natural RNA molecules, you know, they degrade. You basically, you, you sneeze next to them and they degrade. And this is because you can chemically modify them. And we are excited about this type of uh, observation. And we think, you know, can we mod- like, can we find or screen new types of modification, combination of, of modifications to increase the duration of effect of RNA therapeutics? So it's, uh, uh, mm-hmm. but, but just just to make a, um, so you focus not only on um, small interfering RNA, but also on mRNA, like the stability delivery and modification, but also um, like um, RNAi to, yeah, to, to build for, like the like platform, how to screen those different combinations that you mentioned um, in order to achieve the most potent and most durable um Compound, so it's it became broader, right? Exactly. So yeah. it's mm-hmm. it's a platform that allows us to. It's basically the world's first DNA encoded library for chemical modifications of RNA oligonucleotides. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. When I when I, I looked at the at the at your website, and I was like, okay, it's what we know from Dell screens for small molecules, where you have a combinatorial explosion of combination of different building blocks and you attach um, um, the barcode 
and um, which opened so many possibilities in small molecule drug discovery, also yeah. for a very tough targets. And now you transfer this concept to um, to nucleotides. That's um, that's very exciting. And from from what I look, those two problems that you solve. I remember you have this model when we talked before. Do you have it? Yeah, here, yeah, yeah, I have the model, yeah. So, so it's basically like we, we have this, maybe I start with the beads. So we have these beads over here, right? And, uh, okay. and yeah. we can have basically this like 10 million beads, mm -hmm. which is, they are tiny, right? And on each one of these beads, we build an RNA oligonucleotide with different types of chemical modifications. And using orthogonal chemistry, a DNA barcode. Now, the barcode records the identity of the chemical modification, so kind of like purple to purple, yellow to yellow. Mm -hmm. So we can really use this type of, of approach to generate, using combinatorial uh, chemistry, generate a large number of RNA oligonucleotides with different types of uh, chemical uh, uh, modifications that we record their identity on the DNA barcode. So do I understand correctly, for a unique sequence of RNA, you have a unique sequence of the DNA barcode? For a unique pattern of chemical modifications, you unique have pattern. a unique... Yeah, yeah. yeah, of, yeah. Oh, that's very cool. and, that's, and we can screen those in cells, so kind of like we can incubate these beads with cells, get these molecules from the bead into the cell, and then look at the functional output of mm -hmm. the cells, and... This way associate the chemical modifications to the activity levels um, of, of, this, of the modification. So we can have a functional readout for different types of modifications and this way map the, the landscape of chemical modifications and their structure activity relationship. So it's kind of the two steps uh, from the technology. You develop, you have this library that you have created or which is growing and you have also the ability to cleave right and test it in in the cell environment and i think the testing like building structure to the relationship is is also quite exciting because you you monitor the signal right that is that comes from a cell could you talk a bit about about that too yeah so we can monitor the signal we have a reporter gene in the cells so we can look at how the reportogen changes as the effect of our RNA oligonucleotide. Now, if it's RNA, it can be re repressing, let's say, the, the activity of this reportogen, or maybe it complements and enhances the activity of the, it depends really on which modality you work on. Or maybe we can even work on the immunogenicity aspects of the molecule, because the sensor that we have inside the cell can basically be triggered by interferon response. So it's a very versatile technology that allows us mm -hmm. to look at different properties of the of the activity of these molecules and really decipher like the, 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 the properties and be able to associate chemical modifications and combinations of modifications, more importantly, to trigger those behaviors. And you probably, the, the readout just to, there's a trend in, in uh, setting up also screening platforms with cellular readout, whether it's signals, or whatever kind of signals, mostly it's kind of visual um, or light emitting like GFP, etc. cetera, um, or, or um, cre like the, I'm looking for the right word, the, so you have different colors of cells, so you kind of um, differentiate and then you, you can use these images and apply machine learning or computational to, like computational yeah. approaches to to detect the readout that you like detect the signal. Uh, so it's not, from these the are not images. These are actually flow cytometry. Basically, you look at the flow cytometry and, and you sort the cells into expression mm -hmm. buckets yeah. and you sequence each bucket. Okay, so okay, you detect then in sequence. It's it's similar to like what I know from from the Dell. Um, in, yeah, in, in but usually in, in typical, so in Dell there are like two differences. One is that here we have this like on beads because we need to be able to generate both the DNA and the RNA mm -hmm. oligonucleotide on two separate locations. And the second thing is that with Dell, you can use just 
the proteins. You don't do it typically in cells. You just mm-hmm. take a protein yeah. and do that. And here we do it with cells. Yeah. So several challenges uh, uh, that you actually have, have overcome. And I remember reading this paper that you applied it and within on, 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 in, in the context of, um, of COVID. Um, this was a very different technology. COVID, we, we, we did something else. This was a different some kind of else. like algorithm. This is where we started, basically. We started with like an algorithm to identify the most potent sRNA molecules. Yeah. But then we realized that, you know, that's a nice problem. But the more interesting problem is to identify the chemical modifications to those yeah. molecules. Yeah. But still, you had a, in a relatively short period of time, what a picomolar, um, yeah, a picomolar activity of those compounds, and I found this is like mind blowing to have like the the to identify such a potent compound within a short period of time. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yeah, we're all very happy about it. All right, so let's switch um, switch gears to um, like you, your your founder's journey again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, for example, you come from academia, and you said, like, in academia, you can play one game, but in the company, it's a, it's a different game. But, but for you as a founder, where there's particular core skills from academia that were very practical in the context of, of a company or starting a company? Yeah. So I think kind of like, you know, there are some similarities. First, you know, science is science and scientific methods, scientific thinking, your ability to put proper controls, making sure that, you, you know, you don't cheat yourself, basically. It's the same. Um, There are some similarities in communication skills. In academia, you need to to have a job. You need to know how to tell your story, to go in front of an audience and to be able to, you know, basically tell them your story, what you did in your PhD or your postdoc, to get a job. Sometimes when you have like some grants also require you to come and actually, you know, basically pitch your idea. And you need to think how you craft it. It's similar in some sense, it's not identical, but similar in some sense when you go to VCs and you need to pitch them ideas, right? You need to mm-hmm. craft somehow your message. It's a different type of message, different type of story. It's a different way, like, you know, it's there is a, it's a different process, but there are some core skills that are transferable in between the two. Also running your academic group and even starting an academic group, it's some sort of entrepreneurship. You come to a place, mm-hmm. there is an empty room, and somehow you need to grow a lab, you know, in this like empty place. So do, like it's a zero to classic zero to one thing. In a company also, there is the same, same kind of like, you know, there is nothing and you need to create something out of this nothing. The difference is, I think that <clears throat> when you start a lab, although it, it's, it's not an easy task, I don't diminish the um, difficulty in starting a lab you're still part of a university. You're still part of a very big system that knows how to help people who start slabs. And so you have your, you know, HR, like, like all the legalese, all the stuff that is involved, like procurement, everything like is set up. When you start a company, it's a clear slate. And so I think kind of like the cool thing about starting a company is that when you, in academia, you have academic freedom, but it's a bit kind of like, French fries or electric chair. It's not a chair and it's not like French, right? It's like it, these are two, two words are not describing the one thing that they are describing. So it's it's not the same. Like academic freedom doesn't mean freedom. In a company, when you start a company, you have much more freedom. You decide on the structure of your company. You decide on the location. You decide on the HR policies. You decide on the, like, you know, what is the legal entity you would like to create, you decide if you would like to have, you know, I don't know, like ESOP for your employees or you want to run it like some LLC that, you know, like, no, nobody gets ESOP besides. There are so many ways of doing that. It kind of like in, in a way, society tells you whatever is legal is okay, right? It's like, that's a bit of capitalism. They tell you, no, you like, we don't know how to innovate. The, basically, the, the government tells you, we don't know how to innovate. But like, here is like the legal framework. You can do whatever you want within these, like, these boundaries, do whatever you want. In academia, it's much more restricted, right? They tell you, okay, we know how like people should start a lab. For instance, in a company, you can have like you know you, you can decide that you want to have a, a co-founder. It's very common actually. It's actually very helpful mm-hmm. to have a co-founder, 
have I found my co-founder. You know, it's a great combination and took a lot of burden for me when we started the company. In academia, they tell you, no, there is only one founder to the lab, which is a PI, right? We don't have like, we don't mm. co-hire people or, or let's say that, you know, you do a group of like, you work with a group of students and, and you publish this beautiful nature manuscript. Fantastic nature manuscript. Now, it would be like only like reasonable that what if all of you could be hired by this university to keep working on the same thing, mm -hmm. right? You cannot do that in academia. No, like no way. They cannot equihire you suddenly or something like that. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's like one person, one lab. And, and also it creates all these tensions, right? Because as science becomes more, con like academia started, you know, 800 years ago. And then, you know, maybe you had this like, you know, hundreds of years ago, this like Renaissance geniuses that, or oh, you have like Newton. Newton didn't have this like co-author, right? It's like, so you have Leibniz, but, but you have this like people, they worked alone and they worked alone because science was very different those days. But we developed all this academic system to be like, to support this like, you know, like stuff like 400 years ago, 500 years ago which are like working alone, the individual, like you get, you get a PhD degree. You don't like have, you don't co PhD degree, right? It's like your PhD degree <laughs> and you're in the lab. It's like, there is a one PI, the lab, this is the structure. Yeah. And then you realize that, but, but you know, like in, you look at like modern science, it's actually, it's, it's teams of people coming together and working on some, some problems. And sometimes they want to work on more than one problem, but the incentive structure and the legal structure and the, in organizational structure favors individualism, which this leads to some scaling problems. In companies, much more flexible, right? You can work by yourself. You can be like a sole practitioner. You can be a sole practitioner who hires like many consultants. You can have like a small group of people working together as a partnership. You can actually have like a C-Corp, right? Th there's so many ways that you can do it. And you, and you can also, so many ways to incentivize people. Some of which, like, you know, it can be like money, of course, it's easy. And you have, unlike university, you have full control how much you want to pay to people, right? Whether it's like salary, it's like bonuses, it's salary and benefits. You control that. Then you, you can give equity to people, which is actually very, like, we cannot give equity in academia, right? And equity is a very strong motivator because suddenly we have this group of people with different incentives and tell them, listen, there is like long-term goal sometime like you know some like few years in the future that if we are all working really really hard now we're all going to benefit from that thing and it's like quantitative and you can kind of like even know like this like you know the the, the mechanics of it right not some vague yeah. promises so i think that's kind of like you know like i think it's capitalism has some you know some problems in capitalism but it was quite great so far in to foster this type of innovation so i'm not saying it's like the perfect system but it enables a lot of freedom whereas academia who didn't adapt that didn't adapt in the past like you know mm -hmm. 400 500 years we have this system that i don't think people like no it seems like many people after the phd you now are leaving academia they don't want to stay because they are like you know they they've got their degree okay i don't want to be in this system anymore which is a bit sad mm -hmm. So we need, I think, in a so, way, to, to rethink innovation, like rethink about academia, which is also weird. You think about this, like people tell you, oh, in academia, we're innovative. We're super. Yeah, but you guys know, like you don't innovate academia itself. You're just innovative about mm. science. But what about like the way to produce science? So I think two things are very exciting that, that you said. First of all, you said that um, science back then was different than it is now and that the science as we understand it is not scaling, but the complexity is increasing yep. um, of science because we have more data, we have more disciplines, uh, we have new technology, etc. cetera. Um, and, and you also said that going in, like you were at MyHeritage, you were part of the company and you start a company. How could you define, the, how could you bridge the gap between there are so many possibilities uh, to do equity, incentivization, strategy, operations, geography, etc. Uh, what was um, the thought? Maybe the maybe I'm not talking about the framework, but what was the the way you could identify? Of course, it's kind of 
it's adapting to to the feedback you're building. There's some data and um, etc. But how could you bridge like or bring those different parts together, all the complexity, so you have oh okay, so we are we're going to do this. I mean, there, there are many many questions, but it's kind of the uh, the empty space is like academia structured, many possibilities, but we still want to do science. You know how to um, how have you brought those different possibilities? You know what might be called a, a strategy or uh, or company or direction. So I, I think you know. So so some of the things in a company that you can do is like you don't need to be like if you don't want to innovate the structure, you don't need to innovate, right? It's like for startups, there are certain kind of like frameworks that are quite simple that you can, when you start your company, you can, you can start, right? So it's going to be like, you know, a C-Corp, very easy decision, right? Like most startups, if you want to get venture capital money, it's probably you want to be a C-Corp, not very complicated on that end. And then the geography, it, it's a combination, like where do you want to live? Where is the talent? Where, where can you raise money? Mm -hmm. Hopefully you have like, you know, also a reasonable government that can basically give you the framework to operate within this, with, you know, with this geography and will not suddenly will uh, nationalize your company or will uh, basically steal all of your IP or something like that. So, and I think, you know, in the Western world, we are quite lucky to be like, you know, like many places are good places to start companies these days. Mm -hmm. I just think about, you know, like 100 years ago, something like that, right? That would be like quite difficult when the banking system is like, you know, shaky and governments and... I think we are not. We are okay. There's some problems, but overall, we are in better shape than 100 years ago. And so, I, I think many things. It's you don't need to innovate. I just said there is a, like there is a very there are different flavors that you can select. But if you don't want to like waste your time on and, and to innovate in those directions, simply you can go and just use these very well-known frameworks mm -hmm. to start your company. Then you kind of forget to the more tactical things about your compensation structure, about this. And, and in some cases, that's like the culture that you would like to set in your company and different companies have different cultures. It's really about the values that you believe in. So there are no right or wrong answers here. Mm -hmm. So every person needs to kind of like, and, and this is what I think it's useful to have a co-founder because I speak about those things with my co-founder all the time. So we bounce ideas and we keep like, you know, every, every day, we were like, my wife says that I, I talk with him more than with, with her, right? Because every day we, we're like in two different geographies. He's in Israel, I'm in London. But we have like two, three phone calls a day. Just random phone calls. Just, you know, we pick up the phone and we call each other just to comfort yeah. each other. Like, here is my dad. This is what the stuff that I'm thinking. So we can bounce ideas all the yeah. time and, and get this like feedback and, and making sure that, you know, like some things that, you know, like I, I wake up in the morning, I have like 100 ideas, 95 <laughs> are really bad, three are dangerous. Two are okay. So he's the guy that's like, listen, like these are dangerous. Like don't don't do that, right? So that's I think part of I think the beauty of, of this process, of this like constant and it's what is exciting about you know this journey that you have to take all these like different decisions. There are no there is no right or wrong. And 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 you but I, I think I enjoy it because I also go to this point, like I think, you know, getting older, like I don't know, like it gives them more maturity and, and more sense in a way how people, mm -hmm. like you look at other people, you know, it's easier like for me, it, is. it took me some time, right, to, to be mature enough to better understand what ticks them, what do they want, how, like, try to understand their agenda and see how I can harness, you know, like their motivations and see whether, like, how it can be aligned with the stuff that I want for the company. And so you, it's really like, you know, like, that, that's, I think, the beauty of it. We are like, it, it, you form a team of people that are working all together. And of course, you know, there are some, always have some tensions, always some, you know, people have different motivations. So we're all imperfect individuals trying to create something bigger than us. That's the beauty of it. And this process that, and then, you know, and then I have some scientific problems to work on. Or I need to find the right person to the right scientific problem. So all these different types of things, that's, I think, the beauty of being a founder and starting a company. I think so what you just said very, is just, it's just it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, and it's, it's a, a very fulfilling, a very fulfilling uh, process. Yeah, uh, that they're trying to create something bigger than than us. Uh, that's, that's very yeah. cool. Um, 
So with Eleven Therapeutics, you, you, from from the beginning, the idea was to have a platform. The idea was not to have assets or create assets and put yeah. them. It was about unlocking new possibilities with RNA. Exactly. I, I'm, I, I would like if it was just an asset company. This was not the comp. I, I would be the wrong CEO. I would be like a, yeah. Yeah. a very bad CEO for this company because that's not my forte. Yep. Um, Okay, and Which is, um, by, by the way, Sergey, it also brings us maybe like yeah. you know, like to this question of like when people start companies, people, you know, people, everyone talks about the plat, the, the product market fit. It's mm -hmm. really about the founder problem fit, right? Are you like you know the right founder oh, to work on the problem mm -hmm. that you're trying to solve, right? And and you have to work on stuff that that works for you, right? I'm sure I could I could found like I, I could you know start like. Mm -hmm. 10 different companies, probably most of which would not be my, my 410, would not yeah. be my right fit, right? So this one is actually something that I think I can, you know, add something to this company beyond just like, okay, like I'm, I, I, I like to be a founder. Yeah, but this comes along with some self-awareness, right? You had experiences where you know you're good at, you have experience where like it's something where other people like or, or are better than me. Um, yeah. Or I don't have patience with this type of problems, but I, I like this type of problem. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or, or at least I I'm, I'm know that the stuff that I don't know very well and I can bring the right people, yeah. which is also like, you know, some founders have that talent that they can, you know, we, we know how to recruit this like type of people. It's fine. So again, no rules, but it's kind of like more of a process of self-awareness. All right, uh, let's switch for a couple of minutes to um, to provide some from your experience. You come from academia. What would you recommend for academic uh, researchers that think about starting a company or join a company? What what is the like? What are the major differences? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I'm so happy that you asked me this this question because one thing that academics they are not aware of is different types of companies. The thing about being academia. Mm -hmm. It's like when you think about, you know, you think that's a different postdoc, right, experiences. Most academic institutes are very similar to each other in a way, right? Like you go, like you cross, you know, United States, like go to West Coast to this, like Stanford to MIT. It's very similar. Yeah, there are different flavors, but very similar. The concept is similar. You go to Berkeley, which is a state university, and then you go to like a Columbia University. Very similar concept, very similar structure. When you go to companies, the variation between companies mm. is huge. It's hard to like there are startups and you know like tiny companies of three people, and there is like you know like Google and Facebook, which are, you know tens of thousands of people. There are companies that are deep tech companies. They really work on like you know very hard scientific problems. They typically you no, know, they, they don't have any sales force right now because they don't sell anything. And there are companies who are like not there can be high tech or biotech companies, but they develop. It can be a CRO that give provide a service, or it can be like a biotech that just preparing kits for something, which is very mm -hmm. different. These can be companies who are profitable already, and companies who are early stage. These can be companies that the one one thing that I would ask is like, do the company give equity to their employees? Mm -hmm. Right? Do they give any any uh, options to their employees. What's the funding situation of the company? What's the runway of the company? Is it like that's what's the structure of the company? It's there are just so many different flavors, and it's it's, like it's a whole zoo of different companies. So it's not when you think about you know like a postdoc, you really think, oh, I want to do it in this area. And then you think about like good labs, you think about geography, and that really covers your metrics of possible postdoc positions. When you think about the company, it's much broader. It's like what you want a company that is B2B, so works with other businesses versus yeah. B2C. It's a very different company in its essence. Uh, do you want a company that works like a therapeutic company that trying to develop their own assets or you want a company that is really a service for a CRO? It will dictate the dynamics of the company, the culture to some Of course, there is also the, each company is different even within the same domain but will determine your, your responsibilities, the tolerance for failures, 
the compensation structure. So it's good to kind of like understand what is the company in terms of the like the mechanics of the company in which domain they are really, and not just oh they work oh they work on uh, high throughput sequencing that's interesting yeah they're you know very different companies in that domain. Um. So you would would it, you would recommend like to dissect some kind of the the client base the stage uh, the structure the compensation and the culture some 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 kind of yeah. factors uh, to evaluate yeah. I I you know if, if yeah I would go to the LinkedIn page of the company and I would look at the LinkedIn page are they hire like you know how many positions are they hiring what positions are they hiring mm. what business they are I would go and speak with employees and former employees of the company about the dynamic. I will try to learn about the field and see to compare them to other companies and mm -hmm. also ask questions, right? Ask questions in, in the interview process. It's, it's important. It also shows that you are interested in things. So that's like when you are hired by a company. If you start a company, it's a very different process, right? Uh, and when you start a company, I think one like one important thing is like I would like to encourage like people to, to consider having a co-founder. I think it really takes like you know at least like one or two co-founders. Make sure that you have a good relationship with these people. Make sure you do like a founder agreement with them. So if stuff goes wrong and stuff can go wrong, I was very lucky not yeah. to, you know, not to, but stuff can go wrong. So there will be like a good separation. And spend good time with these people right because stuff will get rough very quickly so you want to learn and to see that you can operate it's like finding a partner date with them in a way and also be very you know the beginning like very very like super super early stage in the ideation stage companies are formed like it's like molecules they they mm. form and break and form and break very like you no know, people just like try to find the right thing sometimes it stays and then there is okay let's start something um so, yeah, I think that's kind of like, you know, the, the stuff to just like give yourself some time to form the company, to shape it, to find the right partner, to think about the problem, to think about the domain. Like, what do you want from this company? Now, st things will change for sure as you kind of like really start to execute. But take some time to think about it. Common ground, the foundation. Yeah. Uh, talking about um, molecules... Uh, what what are the emerging new technologies in 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 the RNA space that you are excited about? Um, what are the new technologies in the RNA space? So I think we see new types of delivery systems that are integrating. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of work, also a lot of push to increase the durability of these molecules with different strategies. Our strategy is chemical modifications, but in the case of let's say mRNA, some companies are trying to circularize the RNA. Yeah. Another thing is like in, we see the advent of RNA editing. It's a field that was very quiet for, for some time, but in the past few years, we see it like suddenly mm. picking up. And it, I think that yeah. kind of like it's, it's in a way it's kind of like doing CRISPR to some extent, but without the ability, the, the need to first mess with the genome of someone, which is always like scary and all, also mm. like, you know, maybe yeah. un unwanted, and without the ability, the need of introducing a foreign protein into the body, you yeah. can program this RNA editing enzymes just by like uh, some uh, RNA molecule. So this is quite exciting uh, to see. I think not in the field of RNA technologies, but in a very close field, sequencing, we see just an explosion of different technologies. So if like, you know, five years ago, Illumina was almost the only company in the domain. Yeah, Oxford Nanopore was always like the small and exciting, you know, kind of like sequencing company, but not really, really for like cool scientific applications, but not for the real, like, you know, like large scale sequencing. We see now different types of technologies coming. Um, from from many companies, from uh, Ultima Genomics, um, Element Bio, um, other companies, BGI has a new sequencer. Part of it is because it took some time to kind of like develop these technologies. Part of it is because Illumina, their patents are 
some of them are expired, mm-hmm. some of them are about to expire. So they cannot maintain dominancy. They can, I guess, if we think about like a technology as an S-curve, they're really in the upper bound of this S-curve. It's not like they have any like totally revolutionary thing. They squeezed every, almost every bit of this uh, se- sequencing by synthesis approach so far. That's how it seems at least. Yeah. So um, I think it's also exciting, not just for RNA therapeutics, but for many types of um, essays that rely on high throughput sequencing. Thanks a lot. Uh, at least RNA editing was completely new to me. Uh, mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Yanif, um, we're coming to an end. What's What's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, early Kia. Twitter, that's one way. And people can also like you know send me messages on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, I think that's like uh, the, the easiest way. Great. In this episode, our guest was Yanif Alik, who is the co-founder and CEO of Eleven Therapeutics, a biotech company focused on development of groundbreaking RNA therapeutics. Thank you so much, Yanif, for joining us today and founders in biotech. Thank you, Sergei.